In this video, we're going to talk about section 11.1 .1 in our book, Power Functions. Anything in the form y equals k times x to the p, where k and p are constants, so x is our variable, uh, is known as a power function. So to try to distinguish what is and isn't, let's look at some examples here. So for each of these, we're going to ask, is it a power function, yes or no? And then if it is a power function, what's the K and what's the P? And this is not always obvious. So on the first one, where we have Y equals 3X to the fifth, this is pretty clearly, I think, in the form KX to the P. So yes, it is a power function. And the K is going to be 3 and the P is the 5. Now, on the second one, we want to be able to see the square root of x as being x to the one-half power. So this 2 is a power function, yes, and the k, the coefficient, is 2, and the p, the exponent, is one-half. And for y equals 5x to the third, we can think of that as being 5x to the negative 3. So again, it fits our criteria. And the k, the constant, is going to be 5, the coefficient rather. And the p, the exponent, is going to be the negative 3. Now, the next one, because of that plus 2, it is not in the form y equals kx to the p. And so, no, that is not a power function. Okay, I'm going to slide this up a little bit. We'll do a few more. On the x plus 4 to the second, you may remember that if you multiply that out, we're going to get the first one squared twice the product plus the second one squared. And again, there aren't any of these plus or minuses in a power function. So no, that is not just y equals kx to the p. And uh, the green one, y equals 3 to the x, you may remember, is known as an exponential but it is not a constant times a power of x, so it is also not a power function. Now we have to do a little more detective work. So we are going to think of that as 5 in the numerator. Now the square root of 16t, we can pull that apart and think of it as the square root of 16 times the square root of t. Now the square root of 16 is 5. Four. So now we're looking at 5, and then there's a 4, and the square root of t we can think of as t to the half. Now can you see that we can pull that apart even more? Call that 5 fourths, and then t to the negative 1 half. So now, yes, it is in the form y equals kx to the p. The k, that leading coefficient, is 5 fourths, and p, the exponent, is the negative 1 half. Now the next one is going to take a little work too. We're going to, these are both all multiplying each other, so we can rearrange them so that the 6 and the e are going to hit each other, and that the n to the negative 3 will multiply the n to the negative 2. We'll add those exponents and get n to the negative 5. Now remember, e is a number, it's not a variable. So yes, in fact, this is a power function. Our k, the coefficient, is 6e, and our p, the exponent, is the negative 5. Okay, now the next one is uh, some more of this stuff that we have to separate out. So we can think, I'm just going to call it y to make it easier. So we have a w to the fourth on top. We've got that 4, and the square root of w squared, oh, let's make it more interesting. Let's call it the cube root of w squared, and then we can call that w to the two-thirds power. Now we can see the coefficient here is going to be a k, so we can rewrite that as 1 fourth, and then on the powers we can subtract those, and if we take 4 minus 2 thirds, 4 is 12 thirds minus 2 thirds is going to be 10 thirds. So that can actually be written as 1 fourth times w to the 10 thirds, so yes, this is in fact a power function. Our k, the coefficient, is 1 fourth, and the p, 
the power is 10 thirds. The next one, the green one, h of t, we can multiply, these are all being multiplied, so we can gather together the seven times five is, uh, well, let's go maybe five times two is 10, times seven is 70. We're going to add the exponents, so that means we have to add one half and one third. Remember, we need common denominators there, so that's gonna be three six plus two six is gonna make that be 10 to the five six power. And so now it is in the form of a power function, k times x or t to the p, and our k is our coefficient of 70, and p is the exponent 5, 6. Now, the next one, if, again, we have this issue that if you multiply out that y minus 1 squared, then with all these pluses and minuses, it's not going to be a power function. It's not just y equals k times x to the p. All right, now we're going to explore this a little bit more, and we'll, we'll go in more detail in the days that come here. But let's see if we can look at y equals kx to the n. First, we'll look at where n is just a positive integer. And you can see down here in the yellow, we're going to look at the graph of y equals x, y equals x squared, y equals x cubed, and so on. Then we're going to look at the graphs of y equals kx to the n, where n is a negative integer. And down in the green, looking ahead, you can see x to the negative 1, x to the negative 2, and so on. And we'll look at n a fraction, but not today. We'll come and look at that at a later date because we'll have a pretty full plate on our hands already. So I'm going to just choose the k I've just chosen here to be 1 to make our life simpler. So y equals x to the first, you remember, is just going to be a straight line through the origin, and it's going to have a slope of 1, so it'll be at a 45-degree angle y equals x squared is a parabola that opens up and it's going to uh, have a vertex at the origin. For y equals x to the third, you remember it's going to do that kind of swirling as we go through the origin. And uh, we can see that its end behavior to the left is it's going to go down towards negative infinity and to the right it's going to go to positive infinity. Now, x to the fourth is going to look a lot like x squared, except it's going to be even steeper. So it's going to kind of be like this, like a very narrow parabola. So it's going to take off and get bigger faster as you move to the right and to the left. And x to the fifth is going to look kind of like x to the third again, but it's going to be steeper as well. So it's going to take off and go up faster, and it's going to go down faster as well. So let's pause for a moment and notice our end behavior. By end behavior, we mean what happens as you go way out to the right and way out to the left. So with those odd functions, you can see that they, as you go out to the far right, it goes to positive infinity, but as you go out to the far left, it goes to negative infinity. And so if, you, if we were in the room together, I would say, show me with your fingers in the air that end behavior, and you would show for y equals x that it's going to do something like that with your fingers. Now, with the even functions, you can notice that they go to the same infinity at each end. So they're both going to positive infinity because they have a positive coefficient, both for x squared and x to the fourth. All of our odd functions, I'll say, come and go in different directions. Okay? Notice also that the odd and even behavior. Odd functions, remember, have symmetry in the origin. So if you reflect, if you rotate 180 degrees in the origin, you get back for each of these odd functions the exact same graph. Or if you think of it as a double reflection, if you reflect in the x and then reflect in the y again, then it lands right back on top of itself. For the even functions, they have symmetry in the line y equals x. If you uh, 
rotate or if you fold on the y-axis, they're going to land on each other there. And finally, we'll talk about this more down the road as well, this idea of how do these curves, how do they cross the x-axis? So an x to the first just crosses as it goes through the x-axis. The even functions bounce off of the x-axis. We'll also call that being tangent to the x-axis. And the odd functions bigger than 1 do this kind of squir swirling motion as they go through there, different than what we saw for y equals x to the first. Now, let's compare and contrast that with what happens when we do a negative function there. So remember, y equals... Uh, x to the negative 1 is also known as y equals 1 over x. You'll see that it's going to be undefined at x equals 0, which is going to result in a vertical asymptote. Now, at x equals 1, we know this is going to be 1. And as we go way out to the right, then as we put in bigger numbers like 10, 100, 1,000, and 1 over 10, 1 over 100, and 1 over 1,000 are going to approach 0. So we're going to get a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. And as we approach x from the, the x-axis from the right, as we plug in numbers that are close to 0 but positive, things like 1 tenth, 1 one hundredth, 1 one thousandth, 1 over 1, one ten, 1 over 1 tenth is 1 times the reciprocal. 1 over 1 one hundredth is going to be 1 times its reciprocal. So they're going to get huge in the positive direction. We get that vertical asymptote. And similarly, when we plug in negative 1, 1 over negative 1 is negative 1. As we approach negative infinity, this approaches 0. And as we approach 0 from the left, it's going to go to uh, negative infinity. So we're going to get something that looks like that. For y equals 1 over x squared, now again, we're going to get that vertical asymptote at x equals 0 because it's going to be undefined. But now when we plug in both positive numbers and negative numbers, when the negatives get squared, they're going to give us exactly the same result that we got from the positives, because that negative will get squared out. Now, it's a little harder to see once you start getting to higher powers, but what happens with x 1 over x to the third, it'll look a lot like 1 over x, except that, so it's still going to go through the point 1, 1, because when x is 1, we still get 1, but it's going to hug the x-axis even faster, and it's going to get bigger, steeper here. So we'll get kind of, the way I think of it is, there's kind of a wider, like, chimney, that space between the y-axis and the actual curve on both parts here than there was for y equals 1 over x. But they look very similar. And likewise, 1 over uh, x to the negative fourth, which is what we get here, will look a lot like y equals 1 over x squared, but again, because it gets it blows up faster and it approaches the x-axis quicker, we get what I like to think of as a bigger chimney in that. There's a little bit more space between the y-axis and the curve, and it's going to hug the x-axis a little faster. We'll call this one, when we get to next year, uh, we'll call that the volcano graph because it's supposed to look like a kind of a volcano if you look at it that way. Similar to y equals 1 over x to the fourth. And then when we get y equals 1 over x to the fifth, again, it's going to look like we saw before, very similar to y equals 1 over x and y equals 1 over x to the third. It's just going to... Uh, have a wider chimney, and it's going to even hug the x-axis faster. So similarities and differences. Uh, we can see, again, this odd and even thing happens even with the negative exponents. The even functions, like 1 over x to the second, 1 over x to the fourth, 
are symmetric with respect to the y-axis, and the odd functions still have symmetry in the origin. Now, we can see that these negative exponents have vertical and horizontal asymptotes, and our uh, positive exponents do not. So uh, that's a difference there. Now, the horizontal asymptotes, the way we will talk about that is we'll say when the limit as x goes to infinity of our function, so when that limit is equal to a finite number, that means we get y equals that is our horizontal asymptote. And likewise, if the, whoops, if that limit goes to negative infinity also. And in, the, in these cases, uh, the limit as x goes to positive infinity will be the same as the limit as x goes to negative infinity. For vertical asymptotes, we talk about the limit as x approaches 0 from the right side is going to be positive infinity. So when the limit as you approach a number goes to positive or negative infinity, that is going to result in a vertical asymptote at x equals that number that we're approaching. And so we would say the limit as x approaches 0 from the right for 1 over x is positive infinity, and the limit as x approaches 0 from the left of 1 over x is negative infinity. And so those are where we get the vertical asymptotes. When the limit as we approach a finite number goes to positive or negative infinity. Now we also talked, remember, back uh, a while ago about concavity. And so we said what it means for a function to be concave up, we get this visual that is going to be bowl shaped up. And it, we define it also as when that rate of change is increasing. So in the case of, say, uh, our y equals maybe uh, 1 over x squared, then this is increasing. If we look at slopes of lines that connect various points on the curve, when those slopes are getting bigger, so uh, this slope might be a little positive, a bigger positive, and then a bigger positive still, then that means it's going to be concave up. So we can see, for example, something like 1 over x is going to be concave down for x uh, less than 0, and it's going to be concave up when x is greater than 0. And we can see that our the slopes of lines, the rates of change, the slopes of lines between points as we go from left to right are going to be decreasing. So here's maybe like a negative one-half and a negative maybe say two is a bigger negative number is a smaller number and so we can see that the rates of changes here are decreasing. And so it's going to, that's what we mean by concave down. Okay. Now we have also this idea of dominance, and so uh, it's also known, we talk about this quite a bit in AP Calculus as well, that it's the rates of growth of comparing different functions. So as x goes to infinity, we say something that has a higher power is going to dominate the lower power. By that means it's going to grow much bigger, much faster. So even though something like x squared and x cubed both get big pretty fast, if we were to try to draw those more to scale, what we're going to see is that once we cross over into the positives, that that x to the third is going to get much bigger, much faster than the x to the second. And that's what we mean by uh, dominance or it's got a, uh, it's a, what we're going to call it is a higher order magnitude function. It grows at a much faster rate. So let's talk about some kind of challenging questions here. The first one we'll do without a calculator, and then the second one we'll do with a calculator. So the idea is this is a power function, so that means our f of x 
is going to be x2 is going to be k times x to some power. So I'm going to think of it as y equals kx to the p. And we're going to try to find out what is the k and what is the p. So what we can do is plug in a value of x and y that makes that a true statement. So that we can say is going to be 12, that's our y value, is going to be k, which we don't know, times x, which is 2, to the p power that we also don't know. So then we can do that a second time, and we can get 27, that's the new y value, is going to be the same k, we don't know what it is yet, times 3 to the p power. Uh, I'm sorry, the, yep, that's right, to the p power. And so those p's are the same. So what we can do is, I like to put the smaller one below it. So I'm going to rewrite that 12 is equal to k times 2 to the p power. So if we divide these, so we have uh, an equation here equal to an equation there. So what we're doing is that both sides of the equal sign are equal to each other. So if we think of taking this top equation and dividing it by the bottom equation, because of this equal sign, we're dividing both sides of the equal sign by the same thing. So we're still going to have equality. So that's going to get us to 27 over 12. Now, the advantage here, the good thing that's going to happen is we're going to divide out the k's. So when we divide here, the k's are going to cancel each other. And we're going to get 3 to the p over 2 to the p. Now we're going to do some work. The 27 over 12 we can simplify because uh, I believe that 3 goes into both of those. So 3 goes into there 9 times and into 12 4 times. So that's now going to become 9 fourths. Now this other side is the more interesting part. The 3 over p, the 3 to the p over 2 to the p, we can write as 3 halves to the p power. And so in this case, we can see that that 9 fourths is going to be, we can write as 3 squared over 2 squared is equal to our 3 halves to the p. And so that means we have 3 halves to the second is equal to 3 halves to the p power. And from there, we can see that p is going to be 2. Now, it doesn't always work out that simple, but we'll see how that's going to work in a more complicated case when we use our calculator on the next one. Now, once we know what p is, we can go back to any equation that we like, kind of like the one with smaller numbers. And now we can come back here and figure out what that k is going to be. So since the p is 2, that leads to 12 is equal to 2 squared is 4k. And if we divide both sides by 4, we're going to get that the k is 3. So our power function, our kx to the p, we know is actually going to be 3 times x to the second power. See how that worked? Now we'll do it uh, on a more complicated one here, and we'll need our um, equation, our calculator rather, for this one. So in this case, we're going to pick our x and y value and plug it into our equation, y equals kx to the p. So again, that's going to give us 8, the y value, is going to be k, which we don't know, times 7 raised to the p power that we also don't know. And we'll do that again with the 3 and the 2. So we'll get 2 is equal to k times 3 to the p power. We'll do our strategy again of taking the one with the bigger numbers and dividing that by the one with the smaller numbers. You don't have to do it that way. I just would rather deal with 
I think it's a little easier to work with here, but it's not necessary. So remember, we're dividing these. So the 8 divided by 2 is 4. The k's are going to divide out. That's what we were trying to do here. We're going to get 7 to the p over 3 to the p. But now we've seen how that works. We're going to write that as 7 thirds to the p power. Now, remember, if we're trying to solve this for an exponent, then what we want to do, uh, since this doesn't work out as nice as the other one, we're going to take the log of both sides. So that's going to be the log of 4 is equal to the log of 7 thirds to the p power. We're going to use our property of logarithms and get that exponent, the variable, out of the exponent. And that will leave us with p times the log of 7 thirds. Remember that log of 7 thirds is just a number. So we can divide that over to the other side. And so we're going to get that p is equal to the log of 4 divided by the log of 7 thirds. So we're going to go, I'm going to come back over here. We'll go to our calculator and we'll write down the rounded to three decimal places answer, but we'll use all of our calculator's accuracy when we go back to find the k. So now that we go to, we know the p, we can go to whichever equation we like, and I kind of like the one with the smaller numbers. So now we can say 2 is going to equal k times 3 raised to the p power, which is 1.636. Then we're going to solve for k by dividing that over to the other side. So we're going to get 2 divided by 3 raised to the 1.636 power. But remember, we don't want to use the rounded number. So when you actually put this on your calculator, we're going to go 2 divided by 3 raised to the, and then go capture that decimal that's on your calculator. We'll write k down to three decimal places, and I believe that's going to be 0 0.331. So that's the k and the p for our uh, power function. So we can write it in rounded form as 0 0.331 times x raised to the 1.636 power. Okay? Now, to wrap up here at the end, we're going to do something a little bit different. So, in math, these words mean very specific things. So, when we see the words, when what we see y is proportional to x, or you might see y, is, y varies directly with x, or y is directly proportional to x, or y varies directly with x, that means that, there, that y and x are related to each other by y equals some constant k times x. And k is called the constant of proportionality. Constant of proportionality. So that always means the same thing. Now, it may not always be the variable x. So we could say, for example, something like uh, y varies directly with maybe uh, x cubed. And so what that means is y is k times x to the third. There's our direct variation that is often called. Now, if we see the words y equals, uh, y is inversely proportional to x, or y varies inversely with x, that means that y is equal to k divided by x. So inversely proportional means we're going to divide by those. And again, it doesn't have to be just the power of x. We could have y um, varies inversely with, say, the square root of x. And so what that means, those words mean, 
is that we get y equals k divided by the square root of x. And k is again referred to as the constant of proportionality. So let's see what kind of equations, what kind of problems we might have to solve for. So in the next one in the green here, we see y varies directly with x. So that means y is going to be k times x. And then we also know that y is 12 when x is 4. So that's going to allow us to solve for that value of k. So we'll say 12 is equal to k times 4. So we can then solve that by dividing by 4 and see that k, the constant of proportionality, is 3. So then we can further refine our, our equation, y equals k times x, becomes y equals k, y equals 3 times x. And then we can answer the next part, find way y when x is 10. So now we can say, well, y is going to be 3 times 10, so y will be 30. So that's the kind of problems we'll oftentimes be asked to do. So in a similar fashion, if y varies inversely with x squared, that means we know right off the bat that y is equal to k over x squared. So it varies inversely means k divided by. We can then use the numbers they give us. y is 12 when x is 2. So we'll say 12 is equal to k over 2 to the second. So that means we have 12 is equal to k divided by 4. We can solve that by multiplying that 4 to the other side and get k is 48. So now we know that our equation is going to be y equals 48 over x squared. Then we can find y when x equals 3. So now we'll get y equals 48 over 3 squared. So that's uh, 48 divided by 9. So I guess we can say 3 goes into 48 16 times and into 9 3 times. And so that means we're going to get y is 16 thirds. Okay? Now, it's also possible to mix, uh, mix these up and get combinations. So we could say that y varies directly with the square root of x and also inversely with z to the second. So that means we're going to get y equals our constant of proportionality, k, times the square root of x and divided by z to the second. So it's still one equation, even though we have a, both a direct variation and an inverse variation at the same time, in the same equation. Then we can solve for k. So y is going to be 9 when the x is 36 and the z is 4. So from here, we can see that 9 is equal to, well, the square root of 36 is 6k over 4 squared is 16. So I guess we can reduce this first. might be easier. Uh, 2 goes into, 16, into 6 3 times and into 16 8 times. We can then multiply by the reciprocal. So we're going to get 9 times 8 thirds is going to be our k. We can again cancel and get that our k is going to be 24. So now I'm going to scroll this up a little bit. So now our equation has been refined. We know the k now is 24 times the square root of x all over z to the second. Now we're going to go on and answer the second part. Find y when x is 9 and z is 6. So if the we know the k is 24, we're going to get the square root of x, which is now 9, and we're going to get 6 to the second in the denominator. So that's going to be 24 times the square root of 9 is 3, and 6 squared is 36. Well, I vote that we simplify this first. We can cancel before we try to multiply 24 and 3. We can say 12 goes into 24 twice, into 36 three times. The 3 goes into 3 once, so we cancel there. And our final answer 
is going to be that y is equal to 2. See how that works? Very good.